Thank you so much to everyone who is joining us. We have just a few announcements as we begin. First, we are recording this session and it will be available in Whova, our conference app within two weeks after the Congress ends. If you'd like to ask our speakers a question during the session, please use the Q&A area to the right of your screen. The chat window is where you can engage with other attendees. We also kindly ask that you keep your microphones and cameras off during the presentations and follow the, follow the presenter's lead on when to engage with cameras and microphones on. So it looks like we're getting ready to get started. So I'm going to hand it over to Molly Hunter to begin. Great, thank you. Welcome everyone. And thanks for joining the session. Uh, we're gonna start uh, with Paul Steadline, the Wildland Fire Science Coordinator for the US Geological Survey. He's gonna give us a good uh, overview of the session and what we hope to accomplish over the next couple of days. So I'll throw it over to you, Paul. Thanks, Molly. Can you see my screen okay? Looks great. Great, thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this session. I'm very excited about the variety of people and topics that are being covered in this session. I'm the uh, Wildland Fire Science Coordinator at the U.S. Geological uh, Survey, as well as on the governing board of the Joint Fire Science Program. And I come at this with pretty varied experience with 25 years in management in National Wildlife Refuge System in the Department of Interior, as well as um, about seven years in various science organizations. Uh, the session organizers are Molly Hunter, Kevin Hires, Carolyn Enquist, Ed Brunson, Barb Wilson, Allison York, and Adam Tarando. Um, a, again, a varied uh, organizational representation here. The purpose is using science to understand and take actions on the nexus between climate change, wildland fire, and, and the people. And what I want to touch on is um, we just covered the organizers and purpose, some of the questions and challenges that I see, we see, uh, what our vision is at USGS to try and address this, and then introduce the structure of the special session. So across my career, uh, in the last couple of years, while developing our strategic plan, and in looking at this session and the topics and purpose of it, a lot of questions come to mind. And I'm sure you all will have or have um, a myriad questions as well. Very different kinds of questions, like what's causing all this change in fire regimes and effects to how do I build an interdisciplinary team of scientists to address this, to integrating traditional ecological knowledge with new science, keeping up with the change of technology, all kinds of different things. I don't need to go through all those. But the point is, there's a lot of questions and a lot of challenges in trying to address this and, and come up with some real answers and trying to make a difference on the, the effects that we're seeing, the fire risk that's out there, and how that is interacting with climate change and the other factors. <clears throat> so I'd like to um, touch on pretty briefly, um, how we're trying to address these questions and challenges. I'll give a quick review of our strategic plan and then four of the key areas that we're doing to implement that. The strategic plan just came out this past February and in preparation and development of it, we interviewed approximately 40 organizations to get their input on fire science needs. And it, it was an eye opener for me and I think others as well um, some of the traditional uh, priority research needs like fuels and fire behavior, but climate came out number one response um, across this very broad set of organizations that we interviewed. Social science was very big, as well as some other areas of research needs, but planning uncertainty, and we grouped a number of topics together under uncertainty, and this is looking at the risk, hazards, and vulnerability specifically mentioned uncertainty or scenario analyses and other effects. Also science practices. And that's some of the things that we're talking about is understanding how to link together disparate parts of science or what are the gaps that need to be addressed and then collaboration, tools, effectiveness, other aspects, and then straight up data needs, tools and products as well. So under our strategic plan, our response to these was to establish four priorities. One is produce state-of-the-art actionable fire science. 
Um, and under that, there were four goals. And each of the priorities have goals and strategies. And there's just not enough time, nor do you want me to cover it all in detail. But um, the, the four goals under um, the actionable science is understanding the impacts of climate change and other stressors, how they're interacting to affect fire behavior, fire risk, and the effects to natural systems and human communities. The second is looking at the relationship of fire and fire management to, I would say, the land management or uh, um, more natural uh, values and goals mission of the Department of Interior and other land management agencies. Third is on, on people, all, all the aspects of people from looking at uh, how uh, human caused technicians, but also how do you adapt communities and how do you um, protect the values of the tribal lands. Um, and then fourth is state-of-the-art tools, integrating this all into decision support, the actionable science part of it. Fourth priority is engaging stakeholders in science production. So this is using a co-production approach and, um, and also uh, enhancing science delivery, communication on USGS capacity products and information so they know where to go to get it how to get it, and actually understand the translation of it to meaningful uh, uh, information for them. And then the fourth priority, organizational structure, excellence of organization within USGS, building a program um, out of a confederation of 200 scientists, and then also building the connections with our science partners, such as those represented today. <clears throat> so, we originally I put a story map together of all the different kinds of fire science that we do. And then more recently um, put it into a framework of the fire threat, risk and mitigation. And this is what we came up with. It's a complicated, it's, there's a lot going on. A lot of it is individual silos. And so these are in, can be in, pretty independent areas of research. And then the key question is how do we translate that or that that farm of silos into more integrated approach. And so if we consider the phases of fire, um, if fire is the driver, fire behavior in all its different ways. And so we can start looking at um, how do we enhance uh, fire behavior modeling so it, um, it, it, it better represents not just the forested landscapes, but all the non-forested lands that we're, we have a, a lot of representation in Department of Interior tundra, deserts, uh, sage steppe, grasslands, uh, swamps, um, and make sure that fire behavior can be represented there to predict and assess fire in these different systems, but also then understanding what are the factors that are changing the, uh, the fire behavior and effects and be able to better predict it. And so one of the, uh, one, whoops, uh, one of the, <clears throat> more tangible efforts to do that is a, what we call the Advanced Integrated Fire Science Project, which is a conceptual model to predict uh, fire behavior and couple post-fire hazard models with uh, that prediction of burn severity. And so this is the conceptual diagram of it showing some traditional aspects that, of inputs that go into fire behavior models but then trying to get at specifically burn severity and how that affects debris flow, water quality and flow, and then ability to revegetate. Um, and this trial effort is in the Colorado River Basin, and we are just getting some disaster funding, I think, pretty soon. And we're looking at trying to take a more specific look at the interaction of debris, uh, burn severity with debris flow, water quality and revegetation. How do they interact amongst those hazards uh, to affect things. And then of course, our, our vision is that we can, let, we can re engineer an onion and put the layers back on. So start with a simpler, however difficult, a simpler concept, and then layer in additional factors such as invasive species, climate change, and other things. To do this, though, we've, um, we need to be able to better understand and um, access these models, fire behavior, other ecological models. And so we are seeking to establish a community, an interagency virtual 
of fire and ecological modeling community where we can bring the willing together to work on these. And so we've been working with Los Alamos, Tall Timbers, uh, the Y Fire Commons uh, based out of UC San Diego, uh, Forest Service Research and Development, and, and just working across the mission areas within USGS to be able to better do national assessments, uh, research such as this ACE project that I just uh, pointed out, and then also step into a, a landscape level science application. And so towards that, um, fundamentally what's needed in fire is understanding and assessing fire risk and then planning and implementing the mitigation measures. And so fuel treatments is a big part of that. And so we see a landscape approach to try and do this. And there's a lot of pieces of it. I don't have, we don't have time to go into a lot of the detail, but we're trying to develop the playbook on how that is done. And so a very simple aspect of that is breaking it down into the organizational uh, aspects of it to have a local landscape team where you have scientists working with land managers across the landscape uh, to identify the values, assess the risk, plan the treatments, monitor it, and look at what the change in fire risk is. But to do that, we need these areas of expertise and models to be able to, to uh, accomplish that. And there are key data sets. Some of them are pretty traditional and national coverage. Others need to be developed as needed. But it is inherently multidiscipline and, and the complexity of it, we argue, begs for actual science support in the application with the managers to accomplish these complicated dynamic interacting factors. And part of that absolutely is working with boundary spanning organizations. And I think one of the best illustrations of that is the Joint Fire Science Program and the Fire Science Exchange Network. And you see the different uh, regions of the exchange network there on the graph, uh, the picture on the left. And then the research, the uh, interagency governing board that oversees um, the JFSP program. And so it provides a lot of capability and, and specifically is needed to step it down out in the field. There's others that are critical as well, such as the National Wildfire Coordinating Group that establishes the technical aspects or specifications for the interoperability of fire management systems. And then Wildland Fire Leadership Council, that, um, that is four departments co-chaired by assistant secretaries at uh, USDA and Department of Interior and agency leadership, state leadership, tribal leadership um, as represented through Intertribal Timber Council, and of course, BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, but uh, state foresters, Western Governors Association, NACO, National Association, Association of County Organizations, League of City Mayors, and uh, NGOs such as uh, the Nature Conservancy. <clears throat> so let's, let's go back to this social fabric, this network of networks that represents the science that we do. At USGS, there's four areas that we kind of lump things in that earlier phase diagram of fire in our, our science. Um, we can lump it in different ways. There's different disciplines as shown up at the top. We have key stakeholders that we seek to work with, are working with in a direct way, fire management. And there is a WIFIT strategy that's critical uh, to the interoperability. But there's also land and species management. So the refuge manager or the park superintendent in the other natural resource programs. There's emergency and community managers at local to state or national levels. Um, we do security work with uh, Department of Energy and DOD, um, working on the high side of things as well as low side. And then there is, of course, our great partners in science and knowledge, such as JFSP, Forest Service R&D, many universities, uh, men, a spaghetti soup of, of agencies and, um, and NGOs. So that social fabric is, represents a real variety of disciplines, relationships, organizations. Um, the, and that's important and challenging, very challenging at times to do integrated science across 
these, uh, these uh, representations. Um, there's also rapid change with the environment, technology, knowledge, uh, as well as, um, as specific things as new sensors and satellites. Uh, and so we, we feel that there is a technical efficiency that can be made by focusing on what kind of enterprise architecture needs to be established and meet the business case of fire science or fire research. And so by establishing this, we feel that um, we can make it easier to discover, access, adapt, and use the knowledge, data, and tools. And so this is dealing with the issues of interdisciplinary science, collaborations, ensembles of coupled models that are, we, that are thought to be needed to address these issues, um, efficient curation and serving of both data and models, and then an improved on-ramp for the um, enterprise systems that are used by fire management. And that's best represented by the wildland fire information technology strategy. It's a complicated thing. I think Wi-Fire Commons has done probably the best job so far in defining an enterprise architecture for a research group. Um, but it, it, it needs to go further and we're looking to see how we can move that further. Um, this is something that's been expressed by Forest Service R&D. Uh, Jen Stevens is on and, and um, he's expressed things like this as well as um, uh, other organizations. So a key part of that on-ramp though, it is dealing with, a, you can call it a holy grail, you can call it a quagmire, but going from research to operations. And there's many hard examples of how that has not been done very well. You can have a, a thousand models out there and none supported at the level that needs to be done, but also, um, but that's, that's a key part of it. Engineering it, making sure working with the, the corporate uh, approach to systems and operations. So the last section I have is just covering what's in this exciting suite of presentations, panel discussions, fire circle. And so uh, after me comes um, Adam Tarando will be talking about changing fire regimes. Uh, we have a panel discussion uh, that's addressing the role of agency partnerships, moderated by Ed and Molly. Uh, we have a good representation of organizations in doing that with Carolyn Enquist, Megan O'Rourke, uh, Steve Astoja, Jen Stevens, Dana Skelly. Uh, part two after a break is uh, plausible future scenarios with Rachel Lohman, cultural burning and other indigenous land management practices by Frank Lake, and another panel discussion on manager and practitioner needs and activities. Kevin and Molly are moderating that with Jimmy Fox, an old friend of mine, Kelly Martin, another old friend of mine, and others like Brett Williams from Air Force, uh, Linda Wadley, and Jonathan Long. And then tomorrow, just as exciting and important, our presentations on changing prescribed fire management uh, uh, by John Kupfer, uh, changes to fire regimes by Mary Latta, um, collaborative restoration with Hugh Safford, uh, improving fire management decision-making by uh, uh, Sarah Trainer and Jeremy Little, and drought, fire, and forest loss by Greg Meggs. And finally, the fire circle, which is a great opportunity, in addition to the questions and interaction, all the other presentations and panel discussions, but a true engagement in a fire circle tomorrow, moderated by Carolyn and Molly. And so the last thing, my last slide, the last thing is, Think about what are your questions and challenges and, and interact, bring that up, bring it to the table. And we should be seeing how we can try and address this together because there is no one agency, no one group, no one program that can um, tackle these challenges by themselves. And that's it, thank you. That was really great, Paul. Thank you setting the stage for us. Um, and, and thanks for, for sharing your perspective and all the work that you do with the uh, GS and JFSP. Um, we just have one minute, uh, so not much time for questions, but I encourage you to chat uh, Paul throughout uh, the week. He, he's a wealth of knowledge in both science, fire science and policy. Um, and, uh, but uh, before we go on, I do wanna echo the, 
you know, encourage you to, to really participate, especially in our fire circle tomorrow. That's really your opportunity to um, share your perspective and, and tell, let us know, uh, the organizers of this session, JFSP, USGS, the, the Climate Adaptation Science Centers, you know, of how, how do we move forward and how do we build these partnerships and, and how should we invest in, in science and boundary work to advance um, adaptation to changing fire regimes. Uh, we're also, you know, kind of starting out sort of at a, at a national perspective, you know, looking at the, what, what, what is the, the challenge that faces us? And as we go through uh, the session today and tomorrow, we'll start to get a little bit more localized and look at case studies for, um, you know, how managers are approaching uh, uh, changing fire regimes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Adam Tarando, Tarando, who's a a research ecologist with the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, and he's going to give us that, start us out with that real, that national perspective. Great. Thanks, Molly. Uh, let me share my screen. And, okay. Um, so thanks, thanks again. That was a great um, uh, table setting there by Paul. Um, and so yeah, like Molly said, I'm gonna give a bit of a, a national perspective on, on some work we've been doing, but also with the regional application, sort of tackling two sides of, of, of the coin here in terms of um, background fire state changes, but then also thinking about how that affects um, fire management on the ground, at least in the, in the Southeast uh, US, our, our virtual home for this conference. So just to give a plug for my own organization, this is the, the Climate Adaptation Science Centers or the CASC network. We're within US Geological Survey, but we're a, a consortium uh, network as well that incorporates um, uh, both university partners as well as um, USGS um, scientists and, and science management. And we're here to help. Okay, so I think everyone knows uh, why we're all here and, and interested in terms of how does climate and climate change affect affect fire regimes, fire management. But I just like showing this graphic anyway um, to give a perspective on on the instantaneous pulse of carbon that we've added to the atmosphere. So this is a showing CO2 over the last 800,000 years. That's the scale on the lower hand here. You can see the ice age cycles and then you can see um, how much carbon we've actually added to the atmosphere within the last 150 years. And that will stay up there for hundreds to thousands of years. And of course that changes the earth's energy balance and causes the planet to warm with all sorts of attendant consequences. So this is showing then the observed temperature change now zooming in to just the last hundred years and looking over the next 80 years for California um, and how things could change depending on how much more carbon we put in. If we put in less carbon, we would expect less warming, put in more carbon, we'll get more warming. And then that has attendant effects on the climate aside from just mean temperature, obviously, such as the tremendous and just you know, excruciating heat wave, this extreme event that, that happened last summer, I think, which we all remember. So, you know, one question we have is how could the background fire regime state changes the climate warms? Been a lot of work done on this over the years. Um, we tackled it in one particular way, um, which we'll get into in a minute. But you know, the current concern really is as these background sort of the environmental stuff or soup that that the you know forests and landscapes have to work with. How does that change these these pyromes and 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 the the pyrogeography? You know, one concern you might have is do you get state changes or or tipping points where you you move into a different state? Um, that has a different, completely different sort of fire regime, like we're showing here. This is, just came out in Nature Climate Change, a, a, a little letter that, that was submitted showing these um, changes in forest area that's critically dry fuel state in Australia. But there's another aspect to this, of course. You know, we, we, I, I am a uh, you know, proponent that we're in the Anthropocene where humans are just fundamentally driving many of the fundamental biogeochemical processes on the earth surface and in the atmosphere and the ocean that that will really have really profound changes on, on, on just the earth, those, those earth processes. So this is a, a picture, for example, of, of Fort Bragg, North Carolina, pretty stark difference between the military reservation and then the surrounding 
uh, suburbs you see on the landscape there. And of course, you have a completely different fire regime um, on, the, on the right versus the left, but both are fundamentally dictated by human actions on the ground. Um, there's, there's not enough uh, you know, uh, fire compartments, large fire compartments for, for what's going on on the right to, to usually be set on its own just by lightning fires or other, other types of ignitions. It has to be done purposefully. So we these, see this all over. You know, this is showing out west. This is from Sputnik et al. in 2016, showing um, the change in, in, in uh, as best as we can get it, sort of fire, fire scars, fire records, and how those are really have declined as, as different um, aspects of human activity and, and uh, influence on the landscape really change that fire regime. So we're dealing with both aspects and both the, the humans affecting the the background environmental state, say in the atmosphere, those biogeochemical cycles, but also then changing the landscape on the ground and, and really aff affecting and how those fire regimes transpire. So to me that, and, and for this work we've been doing, I'm gonna show results from a couple of two papers we've, we've recently put out. That, that sort of led to two questions. So number one, how could the background fire regime state change as the climate warms? And two, you know, what will be the key challenges facing these intensively managed systems? And these really are, and most parts of the of the continental U.S. anyway, really intensively managed um, fire regimes to the point where, you know, in certain places there is no, effectively no real fire regime anymore. Okay, so there were two papers that came that were we put out recently as we we think about and work through these these questions. Um, the one on the left came out in uh, um, IJWF. That's talking about prescribed burning opportunities in the Southeast US. That's what I'll actually talk about last. And then the one on the right came out earlier this year in Science of the Total Environment, um, looking at these uh, fire probability projections. Uh, one sort of overarching message I wanna get across that, that we sort of abide by is that simple models can still be useful models. Um, Really complex process models are, are extremely valuable, but you know I, I come from a climate science background and we, we use incredibly complex numerical models um, to simulate the, the Earth's climate. But we also use really simple models as well that can, that can uh, still build a lot of insight and help us really understand basic processes and how they, how they work, interact, what are sort of the nonlinear um, uh, effects or feedbacks that can, that can result as you as you change the system. So given that, you know, back to the original question, you know, how could the background fire regime state change as the climate warms? Um, we use this simple model, it's called PC2FM. Um, it's a simple model um, to understand the effects of physical chemistry on fire frequency. It was put out by um, Diet et al. Um, originally, and one of our co-authors on, on our paper, Mike Stambaugh, was a co-author on this paper as well. And it's, it's, a, it's a pretty neat model in terms of its simplicity and, and sort of elegance, but it's still a process-based model. It's not just a, a, you know, an empirical, purely empirical regression model, um, where you have these terms that are really based at the heart of physics that get, get to what, what drives fire ignition and, and spread. Um, so you have this term in the middle, they call it the Arrhenius term, which is um, capturing the fire chemistry down to molecular collision frequency and, and activation energy required for fires to, to take hold. And then also you have this term, the P and the T are annual precipitation and temperature. And those, those get it in the broad sense, um, fuel concentration and fuel moisture. And you can actually capture a lot of sort of nonlinear effects and dynamics just from this simple process model. Um, you do have to parameterize the model. Um, it's parameterized on, 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 um, with three variables, annual temperature, annual precipitation, and the partial pressure of oxygen, which you can get at pretty easily with elevation. Um, and based on that, then when you calibrate it, they use um, fire scars, um, fire scar database to, to uh, fit the model and calibrate it, you can get a pretty good fit and understand how, say, like moisture um, and temperature are affecting then the mean fire um, interval. You can see this is fit to actual data, this, the circles here, and you get these sort of regimes that start showing up, um, where here where you get these 
This is a reciprocal moisture index. So for very high moistures, which is on the left here, um, you start to get really large fire uh, return intervals. Um, and then as you get drier, you get a, a very short fire return interval, but if you get it too dry, you go back up to higher fire return intervals because it's showing that you just don't have the, 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 uh, the fuels to, to be able to hold the fire. And they put out this cool map um, showing estimated mean fire interval um, over um, the historical period. And so one question we had was, well, how could this change in the future um, given climate change? Uh, one way that I like to think about this um, this simple model is that it's similar to potential evapotranspiration and that it's, it's a useful construct to understand the background environmental state. We're not saying this is the actual mean fire interval, but it's sort of like what could happen under full bore conditions where you just let things play out with the, with the types of vegetation that were on the ground when the model was calibrated. Okay, so this is then our results. Um, the experimental design here, we use mid and end of century projections of burn probability for continental to US, two scenarios for future emissions, one very high, one lower. Um, RCP 8.5 is the very high um, emissions and, and therefore warming scenario. We use 20 statistically downscale global climate models to, to really get a good sample of the uncertainty that we might expect um, due to, um, you know, as the climate warms. Um, and so that's really a big part of this robust uncertainty analysis that we are really focusing on. And we use the pyrome concept as our unit of analysis. We think that's a pretty nice way to um, aggregate the analysis and, and put in terms that hopefully are useful um, for managers. So the projected changes that we're showing here, we show percent change in, again, an annual burn probability. That's That's sort of the the metric we're using. And so um, anything that's 100 or larger is basically a doubling of the, the burn probability. Again, that background potential burn probability. We see variation by time, scenario, and location, but the increases are really everywhere except some interesting um, results here by the end of the century projected under the highest emission scenario, where we actually get reductions in the potential burn probability um, where you're seeing more aridification, um, so more, even more desertification that, that drives down the, the projected ability to, to, to hold fires because you just don't have the fuels. Uh, one thing we really then tried to translate this into something that was potentially more usable, useful and usable for, for managers is this uh, analog analysis. So the idea being which pyromes today most closely match the projected future conditions. Okay, so we start with one pyrome right now, and we look at what, it's, what are its projected burn probability, projected future temperature, and projected future precipitation. Then we see, okay, what pyromes, what current pyrome conditions most closely match what, say, each, what that pyrome we're interested in, its future conditions are projected to be. And we can get, some, you can get some, some pretty interesting variation in results this way based on how much uncertainty there is in the climate model um, and in the scenarios you're looking at. So GCM is an abbreviation for global climate model. So for instance, you could have one pyrome, its projected conditions might, different GCMs could show it, um, could show it matching a lot of different pyromes under today's conditions. Or you could get something closer to consensus where you have just a few pyromes that end up being the closest analogs um, right now to what is projected to happen in the future for your pyramid of interest. So that you can see this results here. So this is spanning that range of uncertainty where you get analog um, uncertainty increases with, with both time into the future because we don't know what's gonna happen the further out in the future you get and with the level of future emissions. So showing for instance, this pyrom analog, it's projected future conditions um, I'll, there's a lot big spread amongst the GCM showing which ones um, would be the closest match given current conditions versus this one where only two pyromes um, show as, up as being the closest match. So you have a lot of sort of consensus and agreement amongst the GCMs for that example. We can then translate this. Um, this is sort of where we're taking it next, where we hope this could be some, some useful ways to, to understand what do these results really mean. So you could start here, say for this pyrome A, 
um, and Montana central grasslands, where the current, um, where the projected burn probability is, 0 .00, is 0 0.07. So then our analysis shows, well, under a lower emission scenarios, these two um, pyromes, the saline basins here, or the Nebraska sandhills, across the global climate models, those were some of the pyromes that most closely match. So if you're looking at conditions today and these two pyromes, that's the breadth of uncertainty that sort of matches most closely um, with this pyrome's projected future conditions. And then you can also see this for say the higher emission scenarios, um, you get some really different results here going down to say in the Arizona plateau or the Southern California mountains. This would be a, a high precipitation outcome, high warming, high precipitation outcome. Okay. So just a few minutes left, but that's that's that first study. And I'll just real quick show you some results from the second study. So now addressing the other side of things in terms of the background environmental state, but now looking at, well, how does management potentially change um, under future uh, climate warming scenarios? So getting down to a regional level now, you know, prescribed fire is a critical management tool in the Southeast. We, we, burn more acres in the Southeast with prescribed fire than any other region in the country. Um, and, and that's a huge part of our management. Why do we do this? Well, there's, there's two primary goals. One, like I think most folks are familiar with is wildfire risk reduction. So this is showing the, the um, at, at Fort Benning, Georgia, the reduction in the number of wildfires, dramatic reduction over time as the prescribed fire um, program ramped up over time. So it's a really effective wildfire risk reduction. But in the Southeast, a, a huge component of this is really habitat management for, we have a lot of endemic and endangered species. We have this um, uh, system called the Longleaf Pine system that is, is strongly dependent on frequent low intensity fires. And again, because of uh, the, the nature of the, the, the changes on the landscape, um, it's really hard for these fires to lots of times to ignite on their own in, in many circumstances. And so there's, there's a pretty strong management element now if we want to maintain a certain habitat structure and ability for these species to persist and thrive over time. And fire management, of course, is sensitive to climate variability and change if, um, because you, 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 you have to gauge the risk. Everyone has their own risk profile, and a lot of these managers have you know, it's pretty risk averse type of thing because you don't want to smoke out your neighbors. You don't want to put your personnel in danger. And so um, if, if conditions aren't right, the amount of acreage that you can burn can really drop down pretty significantly. So this is showing that in, in Georgia where there was a drought and then the acres burn dropped pretty dramatically one year. So then the question is, you know, how can projected changes in climate affect prescribed burning opportunities in the Southeast? Uh, we use some really simple criteria, again, getting back to that mantra that simple models can still be very insightful and useful. Um, but, you know, criteria that for burning that we knew a priori should, should be correlated to when people are actually trying to go out and burn. Um, we then verified those sort of a priori hypotheses of what are the, um, some really important meteorological variables. We, we verified that with permitting data from Florida in Georgia, we looked at over a quarter of a million uh, permit records to, to, to verify when people were actually submitting permits and what were the weather conditions on those days when the, the permitted days to get a sense of what were the actual windows people are using to go out and burn. All right, what we're able to come up with then is once we're able to link those uh, burn windows with the climate data is we get, we're able to project the region-wide percentage of days within that burn window and how those change over time. So this is then showing the historic conditions under three, um, you know, sort of arbitrary seasons. What are the percentage of days that occur within that burn window, that, that sort of verified burn window we were looking at in the Southeast? Um, green means higher percentage of days available. Not surprising, there's fewer days in the summer. Uh, what you really see though is these reds starting to take over um, by the end of the century under both the lower and the higher emissions scenarios. Obviously summer just kind of disappears as a potential burning season under the high, very highest emission scenario by the end of the century. But it declines a lot also um, as well as creeping into the transition season um, even under the lower emission scenario. 
we're able to take advantage again of multiple climate model results. So spanning, sampling that uncertainty that we have to consider many possible futures. Um, and then we can use these simul simulations to stress test plans under a range of conditions. Uh, one thing we see here is showing the results for the Kasachi National Forest in Louisiana. Again, under the higher emission scenarios, um, there's really an increase. Um, the variance starts to increase by the end of the century. So what's that showing you for managers is there's, as you move through time, there's decreased reliability in the burn season. So you really have to start to take that into account and that might affect your risk profile now. You might start thinking about different actions or strategies you might take um, over time to, to, to mitigate against that risk if you still wanna be able to accomplish your, project, your, your objectives. Um, all right, I'm gonna skip these results just in the interest of time and just to um, follow up saying, where are we taking all this? Um, you know, we have a project we're starting where can prescribed fire managers adapt to a warming climate in a way that still allows them to accomplish their short-term, medium-term, and long-term objectives. So we have this funded project through the CAST network. The idea is being that risk profiles may change over time, depending on if you're looking at next week versus next month versus five years from now versus 30 years from now. And we're hoping to um, provide managers with the tools and information they need to be able to incorporate different uh, scientific models and predictions to be able to better understand how that risk profile changes over time so they can plan better now and into the future as the climate changes and climate warms. That's all I had. Um, thanks very much for your time. Ha happy to answer questions as the session moves on. Thanks very much. Yeah, that that was great, Adam. Thank you. Really, really interesting talk. And I think we'll have a chance to hear uh, a bit more tomorrow about sort of uh, the changing seasonality of prescribed burning in the Southeast with uh, uh, John Kupfer is gonna, gonna kick off our session um, tomorrow. So that's great. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll have to just move on to our panel discussion. But if you have questions for Adam, certainly put them in the chat and, and we'll be able to address them throughout the session. Um, but moving on, we're gonna um, sort of still think about this sort of national scale. Um, our next panel is, is composed of folks who are really in science funding organizations. And uh, the purpose is to talk about, you know, really how do we build out the, the type of partnerships and interdisciplinary uh, collaborations and cross boundary work that's really needed um, uh, to advance the adaptation to changing fire regimes. So I'm gonna kick it off to Ed Brunson, who's the program manager for the Joint Fire Science Program, and he's gonna moderate uh, this panel. Okay, well, thanks, Molly. Um, as, as you can see, Paul and Adam did a great job of teeing up for all of us basically a good description and the layout of the size of the challenge of the, and the, the issue facing all of us. And we clearly want to focus at the first part of this session on examples of partnerships where we're already trying to work together to collaboratively develop approaches to addressing this, particularly in the development of science. What we have now is for the next hour, we're gonna have a panel an opportunity for, for all of you to interact with um, five leaders who are already working in this way um, from various agencies, developing partnerships. So it's a chance for them to talk about the existing partnerships that they have, and also to lay some groundwork and to plant some seeds, if you will, give you some ideas about things that they think we can do in the future. So we're gonna have short presentations from five, uh, five leaders and then we're gonna have uh, a time after that for questions and answers um, for an interactive panel. So um, feel free to put questions in the chat um, or, or if you wanna wait until we uh, get, to the, get to the open discussion part, you can present them at that point as well. So we're gonna start with a representative of the Southwest <clears throat> US, excuse me, the USGS from the Southwest CASC. Carolyn Enquist, and I'm in the interest of time, I'm not gonna give long introductions of any of our panelists. They will be able to expand on their experience and their background um, in their presentations. So our first is presenter is Carolyn Enquist from the Southwest CASC. Carolyn? 
Thanks so much, Ed. Really appreciate that. Can you see my slides? They look good. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, um, it's a real um, honor to be here um, with you all and uh, talk about some of these issues that um, we're, we're facing. And I think Paul and uh, uh, Adam did a really terrific job um, in really starting to kind of lay out these challenges that we face um, in our as scientists, as managers. You know, they're certainly complex and uh, um, transformative. And we've also found that some of these changes have been more gradual. And that's sort of what this uh, slide on the left represents. Um, Adam brought up the Anthropocene or the Anthropocene, depending on which, which continent you're from. And, uh, um, you know, this is sort of kind of this gradual sort of idea. But on the right, um, things can happen really very quickly with very little time to have any sort of transition and preparation. And that's often the case uh, with fire. So we've been facing these issues for a while now. And I would say that, you know, over the last decade, we've really started to kind of think about, well, how do we cope with these issues? And we're now finding that just coping strategies um, really haven't been enough. And that we really have started to think more in terms of how do we, how do we make adjustments and the kind of science we do, the kind of management we do so that we can have, uh, be more effective in facing these complex challenges and maybe even have the opportunity to have some more transition time. Um, but now we're also realizing that we can't really wait any longer to figure all of that out. And we're kind of at that point where we need to be much more transformative in our thinking. Now, over the last five years or so, as been mentioned, we've been thinking a lot about science translation so that um, we recognize it's not just about having new and better science, but it's about how we communicate our science. And we really can't afford to just be speaking at one another and not just through scientific journals as important as they are. And as I talk, I'm not dismissing science at all as a scientist, but just recognizing that we, we really need to have more credence towards some of these other things that um, involve ourselves as humans. And so instead of talking at one another, um, we need to get together, really kind of work through these issues together, bringing interdisciplinary partnerships and really kind of consider the vast array of things that and considerations and components that go into decision making. And a lot of these are social components. Um, and so this has kind of have been happening as been mentioned in kind of the co-production science translation that the CAS network and others have been spending a lot of time um, working in. We've also spent a lot of time thinking about scenario planning. So this is kind of a new, not just a tool, but a process for um, really kind of taking our models and translating them into futures where we can start to imagine what we might be faced with. And it's still very confusing, um, but it has allowed these kind of techniques, these processes and structured decision-making in particular have brought us closer to providing these decision-making contexts. And so these approaches um, have been very effective with a number of our partners, um, both on a local level and regional level. But as was mentioned before, um, and I think it was Paul that said it, you know, we can't go it alone. And um, more and more, we've started to recognize that Western land stewardship is not enough. And that it's time we recognized and embrace traditional practices such as cultural burning. And this has been taking place much more frequently in California and other places where the profile of these practices have um, really been raised and the recognition that together with Western science and, and Western approaches and thinking about 
how our prescribed fire, our Western approaches, where they originally came from. And of course, these practices have been put on, on the ground for millennia. And, you know, we, we just need to think in terms of that indigenous cultures um, are very similar to um, what we might, and this, these experiences are similar to what we might call science. And we need to recognize that um, there's a lot of credence in, in these approaches and that when we do our prescribed fire and we combine it with the likes of cultural fire, we can also recognize it's not just an ecological problem that we're having. It really is a people problem. It's a cultural problem. It's bringing these things together and um, getting fire back on the ground. And let's see, I just there we go. Um, so finally, um, I wanna close by really stressing this point that the hardest part of this has really been about you know, partnerships or relationships. And in COVID, this has been especially hard is how do we really create authentic and inclusive relationships that lead to strong partnerships where we can then generate the buy-in, ultimately the, uh, the policy, et cetera, that will get us over these barriers of getting more fire on the ground. And we've attempted to do that at the Southwest Cask through two new um, projects that I wanna highlight. Um, one is called the Southwest Fire Cap, where we've worked uh, very closely with the Southwest Fire Science Consortium to bring together a diversity of partners um, to, to that have a shared vision and we can build these cross collaborations through on the ground, uh, uh, what we're calling round tables and indigenous practices and partners are very much at the center of that project. And finally, another project takes place um, specifically in the Southern California mountains. And it's a project that we're working very closely with the Forest Service and others on, and it has very much a outreach component in addition to the science, um, but we're really trying to kind of um, really take all that we've learned over the last uh, couple of decades and also these processes and relationship building, bring them together so that we can indeed have the opportunity to have better chances for success. So with that, I will, stop sharing and pass it along to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Carol. That's a great example of, of the USGS working with local partners um, to take this challenge on. So um, in the interest of time, I think we're going to move through the, the speakers. And at the end, we will do we do hope to have um, time for, for numerous questions. So um, that's the approach we'll take here. Um, our next speaker is coming to us from the Forest Service and his name's Jen Stevens. And Jen's is gonna work at the national level um, for, the, for the US Forest Service. And Jen's is gonna present kind of that perspective. And I would expect Jen's, given your, your background with USGS, you probably have some experience from there that you would like to, to bring to us as well. So please take it away, Jen's. Great, thanks a lot, Ed. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, as Ed mentioned, I'm the National Program Lead for Wildland Fire and Fuels Research for the Forest Service. So I'm based out of the Washington office, but until recently, I was a research ecologist with the USGS in New Mexico. So I'm a bit of an interagency partnership myself. Um, and so the thoughts I'm gonna to share today are just kind of briefly some of the things that I've been thinking about to, uh, to tie together this question of uh, adapting uh, changing fire regimes to climate change in an interagency context. And this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but I think some examples of uh, ways that we are currently functioning well as an interagency science community in particular. So I have that sort of science perspective, um, but thinking about it in an applied context um, and some ways that we can build upon what's working. Um, so just the, the quick bullets that I'm gonna hit here, the, the four, uh, Themes are data sharing and accessibility, prescribed fire, using prescribed fire as an opportunity for climate resilience that uh, brings together collaborators and scientists from multiple agencies, 
um, thinking about post-fire management in a climate resilience context, and then the importance of knowledge networks of all sorts to tie this information together. Um, and so I, you know, I, I start with data sharing and accessibility. I think uh, as fire science moves into a sort of a uh, increasingly a big data kind of field, there's a real need to uh, continue to make data accessible, make it well documented, um, and make it available at the scales uh, that we need to make management decisions. And there are certainly examples of this already in place. Um, I think Paul highlighted a few of these in, in his talk as, you know, sort of the, the flagship examples for interagency uh, data portals, Landfire being one, MTBS being another. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to, you know, do the same sorts of data portals for uh, climate data that can inform fire modeling, fire predictions. Uh, we already have, you know, a number of data sources out there um, that can track trends in fire weather and climate. So I think uh, it's important to continue to build these out and think about how we can additionally incorporate climate adaptation information into portals that already exist, um, since we have a lot of the framework and architecture set up to do this sort of thing. Um, and I think one thing that we're, we're lacking, and, and Paul sort of alluded to this as well, is um, sort of a, a development hub, if you will, for wildland fire decision support tools. There are uh, a rapidly expanding universe, there is a rapidly expanding universe of uh, tools and data sets for all sorts of fire related topics from pre fire planning to fire management response to post fire decision and operational space that uh, are constantly being developed and they are in varying stages of development and updating and, and often they can sort of just sit in a in a no man's land uh, without having a real home to sustain uh, the application of those tools. So I think that's one area that the, the wildland fire community can work together effectively in an interagency sense to uh, build the capacity and the infrastructure that we need to host these sorts of things and keep them current. There's a lot ongoing. There's been a lot of talk at this particular meeting around the importance of using prescribed fire to increase our pace and scale of restoration, especially in the West where we have a, a real need for it uh, at landscape scales. Um, to, to restore resilience to dry forests. And so there are numerous examples already underway of work that both occurs uh, in an interdisciplinary context and within an interagency context, uh, including the fire and smoke model evaluation experiment. Uh, a lot of exciting work in the space of coupled fire and atmosphere models that uh, brings together expertise from different agencies, data sets from different agencies, and um, unites it in focusing on a single burn event uh, to learn and be able to make better predictions about uh, prescribed fire operating space. Uh, we're doing some work within uh, fire uh, forest service R&D on a national prescribed fire assessment. It's in the early stages of planning that's gonna bring together, again, interagency partners to discuss not only the uh, ecological and biophysical science of fire, but also the, the social science and the management applications of prescribed fire. Um, Adam touched on this in his talk, but I think one, you know, one important area that this research can uh, bring together that interagency perspective is uh, to address the question of climate change, expanding fire seasons, and how this might affect prescribed burn windows. Uh, and, and Carolyn touched on this in her talk as well, and I think there's a lot of momentum that's really exciting to see about uh, really centering indigenous traditional ecological knowledge and how we can bring that experience and those perspectives into cooperative burning programs. Um, there's momentum behind this at the national level as well. Right now, a recent White House memorandum made the point that indigenous traditional ecological knowledge should inform federal decision making along with Western scientific inquiry and should also be incorporated into climate adaptation planning. Um, there's a lot of congruent effort around what to do after a fire as the area burned, uh, especially in the West, continues to increase steadily. More and more, we are managing post-fire landscapes and we need to be strategic about how we do that. There are some key themes emerging across geographies. Some of these were touched on in the session earlier this week. Um, some key themes from this work include, number one, the real importance of incorporating climate projections into reforestation programs, uh, both from a, a genetics and a local adaptation context, as well as from a uh, strategic prioritization context. We wanna be efficient and strategic around where we're putting trees back into the ground to give them the greatest probability of success uh, and resilience to increasingly frequent fires across the landscape. And on that note, the, the second 
pillar that's emerging from this research is that there's a real need to anticipate more frequent fire intervals when managing post-fire landscapes. That's a, a very clear climate signal that um, we really need to be considering that once uh, an, a landscape burns, it is, it's a very effective fire break for maybe up to 10 years, sometimes less, and then it's very likely to burn again. And so we need to think about, are those post-fire landscapes resilient to uh, increasingly frequent fire? There are, again, a lot of decision support tools out there to support this sort of work. Um, the one I'd like to highlight from the Southwest that I'm familiar with is the Southwest Fire Climb. Uh, there's a menu of uh, adaptation options within there that specifically deals with post-fire management. Uh, and then lastly, I think there's a real, uh, another theme that emerged, I think, from, from um, Paul's talk as well as from Carolyn's is that there's a real need for uh, information sharing. And I think knowledge networks are a critical platform for doing that, not only for disseminating knowledge, um, but for promoting tool and technology development, for synthesizing science in a way that's digestible. And there's uh, uh, there are a large number of networks out there currently that do this sort of work and they're really invaluable. A few examples are highlighted here. Um, and I think one of the th one of the models that these knowledge networks often tend to form is that they're really cohesive regional networks and that they have lots of uh, regional and local expertise, but they function as a national network and it's the functioning, uh, it's the, the uh, integration of those regional hubs that can provide a national perspective while also uh, being really sensitive to local conditions. And so I think, you know, there's some things that we need to make uh, all this work that we're, are constantly a work in process, but one that I always really try to hammer is we really need to be focused on adaptive management and monitoring. Uh, monitoring cannot be an afterthought. And even if we're making decisions in a space of uncertainty, we need to design actions to enable learning. And this is particularly true for complex social ecological problems. Uh, we need staff to do this work. I think especially uh, these interagency liaison positions uh, basically demonstrate that agencies are committed to working with other agencies and uh, they are you know, very important for communicating outside of the, the silos that Paul was describing um, and getting us to you know, work well together. And above all, that, that interagency partnership requires trust and transparency and communication. These are all interrelated. You can't really have trust unless you have transparency and communication. So um, the working relationships are constantly being cultivated and tended to. And I think uh, you know, forums like this are an important way to continue those conversations. Uh, to increase awareness of what we're all doing and think about ways that we can work together effectively on this complex problem. So thanks again uh, for organizing this and I'll throw it back over to Ed. Appreciate it. Well, thanks, Jens, for that great national perspective. Um, lots, of, lots of food for thought that we'll be able to dive into here in a, in a few minutes. Well, our, our third panelist, um, comes to us with a, a very unique perspective. Um, you know, we have, we have two panels and following this, we'll have a panel of managers and our next presenter actually could, we debated she could fit very well in either panel. Um, but but um, because Dana Skelly is the chair, I'm sorry about that, my phone's going off in the background, is the chair of our Joint Fire Science Governing Board, we asked Dana to, to join us for this panel and bring her two-part perspective. One is, the chair of the Joint Fire Science Program Governing Board, but also as a very active user of science. Uh, Dana is with the Forest Service in Region 6, um, based in Portland, Oregon. So Dana, I'll kick it over to you. Please take it away. Right on. Thanks so much, Ed. And thanks, everybody, for joining us for this conversation today. Um, I'm not going to give a PowerPoint. I'm just going to, to fly over a few themes that I think are really um, that helped tie everything together, like Ed mentioned. Um, I did put a few things in the chat. Some of those links are tied to my profile in WOVA, um, so you can find them there, but um, I'll touch on those. And then you can follow up uh, with um, on your own time to, to get some more information, and you can always reach out to me. Um, so like Ed mentioned, I manage the fuels program for Region 6 of the Forest Service, the Pacific Northwest. Um, I also um, am the chair of the Joint Fire Science Governing Board. I'm uh, going into my second term in that role. Um, and, and that's just the best experience that I could have wished for in my career, the blending of science and management. That's just always been a focal point of how I've tried to mold myself. And so um, just a little more background about me. Um, I, I'm going back to school actually for a PhD right now at Oregon State in the School of Forestry, go Beeves. And um, uh, and then I'm um, and then I've, I've 
I've worked extensively in research in fire ecology and fuels. I'm also a type three incident commander. I go out as a fire behavior analyst with a type one incident management team uh, that's based here in the Pacific Northwest. And I'm, I'm a prescribed fire manager and burn boss. So again, like I'm um, doing everything I can to embody bringing the best available science to the field has been important for me. It's been important to model that behavior and, um, and encourage it in the folks that are coming up in the ranks. Because uh, I think many of you know, but um, about 25 to 30 percent of the firefighting workforce is eligible for retirement, uh, the federal firefighting workforce in the next four years. So thinking about successional planning and how we grow the future is, is really on my mind a lot. And all of these things tie into that very nicely, because when we talk about co-production and we talk about the dynamic and really um, challenging environment that we are we are working with all the tools in the toolbox to address together, um, how we think about the next generation of fire leadership is a really critical piece in that and building them from the earliest stages in their career with co-production as the way they do business with using the best available science as the way they do business. I don't think we can do any better than to think towards the future in, in that vein. But back to the, the main themes of this panel and, and some of the, the points that I wanna highlight and, and the last piece about how it all comes together for me going back to school too, because we've had some really interesting conversations lately about research and um, how it's set up and what our expectations are. Um, when we think about the academic environment and we think about um, the master's uh, you know, two to three year regime and the PhD candidate, uh, maybe two to five, or longer year regime. And then we think about some of the pressing needs and climate change. Um, a lot of what we're seeing um, is that the environment is changing so quickly that research, if you're trying to make a conclusion about this aspect of the environment or that aspect of the environment, by the time you complete your work, it's possible that it'll be very valuable in and of itself for that point in time, but will it be replicable into the future? I think that's a really fair question to ask when we think about a no analog future in a lot of our environment. So um, going back to the links that I put up there in the chat, the first one is a blog post that I sent out this summer. Um, it's a pretty easy read. I think it's like five minutes uh, of your time, but um, we're really seeing a nexus between some of the newer indices that are getting a lot more um, study like vapor pressure deficit and how to express better what's happening in a changing fire environment in terms of uh, broader availability for of fuels for longer periods of time, no direct correlation specifically to a change in snowpack or winter conditions and fuel availability, but it's something broader than that, which I feel from what I've seen on the ground and what I've started to study that vapor pressure deficit is, uh, is really a key component of that. Um, and, and how that applies to what we're seeing in the field. And just some quick stories from this summer um, where we had another explosive fire season and where we were really challenged um, both because of the COVID environment and how that's changed how we um, operate on the ground and the logistical uh, expectations that, that have changed uh, related to that. And because we have so much more fire on the landscape at any given point in time, and the social aspects and expectations haven't changed around our response to those fires. Um, and, and then the fact is with climate change, our hands are really tied in a lot of ways about what successful fire management might look like going forward versus what it might've been when I started my career in the late nineties. So this summer we had, um, what's going on for the firefighters on the ground is we're used to recognition prime decision-making. We're used to thinking about our actions based on what we know in the past. But what we are experiencing is not analogous to anything that we've experienced in the past. And so our folks are making decisions as if a nighttime recovery of 74% is, is the same today or in August of this year as it would have been in August even six years ago. It's not because nighttime temperatures are increasing at more than twice the rate of daytime temperatures. So all of our slides are playing out in a way where people may not be making the best choices when they go to scout a line ahead of a fire and try to find the best control points when they try to um, send resources into a place that they think they could safely work. And it turns out that our assessment wasn't correct. So what Paul talked about at the very beginning of this session and other folks have touched on with the need to improve the models, that is very true. We also need to improve our expectations around how we implement any of our activities from prescribed fire to wildfire 
control. So, so that, that is something that I touch on in that first link. In the second link, and this is really germane to my, my current job in the Pacific Northwest, and I just couldn't be prouder than to be working in the Pacific Northwest of the Forest Service, because we um, are, are, to no one's surprise, always in the top three for our timber harvest uh, accomplishments, right? It's uh, Region 6, Region 8, Region 9, always the top three in the agency. Um, we're really good at growing things. It can be really wet here and things do like to grow when it's wet. So, and they grow big. So, uh, so that's not a surprise at all. But what I learned when I came into this position is we're always in the top three for our fuels accomplishments. And I think that has a lot to do with Oregon and Washington being highly resource-based economies. Um, a lot of our population is rural. And the other big piece is we were the tip of the spear for the timber wars. We were the tip of the spear for major cultural changes and implementation in the Forest Service, which has made us the tip of the spear for collaboration. And so that second link that I put in there is a tie to the University of Oregon. Go Ducks, can I say that? I think I can, I'm wearing green, it's okay. So go Ducks, um, but they have done some tremendous work looking at local rural economies, looking at the collaborative landscape restoration program, looking at focused multi-year funding and how those opportunities play out in our actual work on the ground. In Oregon and Washington, we have collaborative groups that blend industry, environmentalists, non-governmental organizations, uh, universities, and local state and federal governments to really find where we have common ground and start to build zones of agreement and and fundamentally more trust again around that common ground so we can continue to increase the pace, scale, and innovation in our treatments. And the papers in that uh, website, you'll find a wealth of information there that, that points to it that you might find really interesting and useful. But a really easy example of why that's so effective is uh, one of our national forests, the Malheur, where I came from, uh, was deputy fire staff there before I moved to the region, uh, had not been sued on any NEPA that included commercial harvest, which is a big deal in this agency, uh, from 2003 till just this year. Um, and they've been putting out 60 to 75 million board feet a year, which is a pretty decent amount uh, in this day and age for an agency for commercial harvest. So collaboration, the point of this panel, uh, on all levels, from science to management, and with all of our invested stakeholders is critical giving ourselves the space to build trust is important when it comes specifically to what we're doing on the ground with fire management. It's more than giving ourselves the space for trust. We have to get comfortable being uncomfortable and we have to really um, grow to have a better understanding of risk together and how we frame that because that's going to drive how we prioritize in a constrained environment, constrained in time, money, and people. And we also have to find better ways to talk about risks so that the public understands the discussion and then we're going to have to think about how, how we use our past to project into the future and what the limitations of that might be going forward with climate change. And so one piece um, to tie into a piece of research that Jen's uh, highlighted, um, the research was talking about, you know, maybe the, the fires aren't um, as effective as they were uh, beyond 10 years. What we saw this summer and what we've been seeing increasingly in the last couple of summers is that um, actually beyond three years, they're not really that effective anymore. Um, it depends on the time and the season. It might depend on um, the live fuel moistures and if we had, uh, and what kind of moisture regime we had, ambient conditions preceding the, the, the height of the summer burn window. But honestly, if we're planning on management um, strategies and what would be effective in terms of control and protecting communities, um, it, it's hard to rely on any fire scars that are older than three years at this point with confidence. So the last link that I wanna highlight, and then um, I think I'm gonna wrap up my piece, is a fuels treatment effectiveness dashboard that's public facing from 2018 from the Pacific Northwest. That was the first year we had more than um, 900 interactions across the BLM and the Forest Service in the Northwest um, in that fire season. And that's not just because the treatments were luckily placed in the right place. It has to do with changing management strategies. And when we aren't getting things on initial attack, 
using those treatments more proactively, being more thoughtful about where we're putting our lines in and using them um, more quickly at the outset of recognizing that this fire is going to be big and, we're, and we need to think about our decision space differently. Um, we're in the process of finalizing our 2021 uh, database that's also public facing. This year, uh, not a surprise with the bootleg fire, uh, which was um, almost a half a million acres, we um, have already assessed over 1,400 um, fire treatment interactions. And the dashboard is very close to being finished. We'll have that link accessible from this link. And so we'll be um, happy to share that with you and get your feedback and thoughts. So looking forward to some additional conversation. Thanks so much, Ed, uh, for having me as part of the panel. And, um, and again, if we don't all get time to talk here, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks. Wow, thanks, Dana. Lots of food for thought there. You've got the national perspective from, from Jens, and you got a kind of a regional and a on the ground perspective from Dana. So that's, that's great perspective uh, for us to think about. Um, Jens mentioned the climate hubs as a science delivery or a knowledge exchange tool that uh, he felt was very, very important. And I would tend to agree with that. So, and it's very timely because our next presenter comes to us from the California Climate Hub with the USDA. Steve Osteha is, I'm excuse, sorry, Steve, I think I mispronounced your last name, um, is now going to tell us a little bit about the USDA Climate Hubs and their role in helping us build these partnerships. Steve? Thanks, Ed. Yeah, so it's a, it's a tricky last name. I, I know when I show up at the airport and they're trying to check me in and, and I hear some variation of the theme, it's me. Um, I totally get it. So Stephen and Stoya, I, um, I, thanks for having me. These are, these are fantastic talks. They're, they're wonderful ideas. Um, it just honestly makes me miss getting together with um, so, many, so many dedicated and, and sharp and thoughtful folks that are a part of this community. So that's been a really great reminder for me. Um, I'm really humbled to be standing amongst you. Um, so I am the director I'm humbly the director of the USDA Climate Hub for the California region. We're located in Davis, California. It's functionally applied climate science program interagency um, within the department. It's a, it's a wonderful program, akin to some degree to the one that uh, Carolyn spoke to, the, the Climate Adaptation Science Center. We work closely with them. They're great partners. Uh, I'm also a fellow and affiliate faculty at UC Davis within the John Muir Institute of the Environment. And I think most importantly for this uh, short talk, which hopefully I'll get through in about five minutes or so. I happen to be, um, which I'm not sure if this is this is a pro or a con, it depends on the week or the day, the co-chair of the science advisory panel for the Forest and Wild Fire Resilience Task Force that was set up by Governor Newsom some, times ago, some time ago. Um, that's my email. If you want any information, of course, you can, you know, I'm not, a, I don't follow Twitter, <laughs> you watch the news, but um, that's there in case you, you do. Um, See if I can change my slide here. Figure this out. Okay, so I um, I kind of did a little bit of a last minute change up, and, and I honestly think what Jen set up is is this is really going to be a nice complement to the application of some of those concepts, ideas, and suggestions. Um, you know, California is a unique place, um, and. You know, I've, I'm a third generation Californian, and you know, which isn't long. There were there were generations and gener generations of of peoples here long before us um, that were stewards of this landscape. But in my in just the short period of time um, since returning back to California, since uh, getting my PhD in Utah, I've I've witnessed our systems change, and they're changing rapidly. I'm an avid mountain biker, and I'm I'm now going through burn scars regularly. At, at low elevation, um, and it is alarming. So I thought that it would be useful to kind of illustrate what we are doing right now in California. Um, not what we could do, not what we ought to do, or we need to do, but what we are doing. Um, and I'll say we don't have it figured out. Some of what you're gonna see here in the next few slides are work in progress, some of which we're grappling with um, with the, uh, the co-chair and, and senior scientist from U.S. Forest Service, John Battles from UC Berkeley, and then the senior scientist, uh, Pat Manley, we're kind of working through a lot of this right now. Um, so it's a little rough and it's in flux. But what we have in California is we have this, this task force that was set up, stood up. 
It was initially stood up by um, Secretary of uh, California Natural Resources, Crowfoot, and at the time, um, now Chief Moore, but Randy Moore, now replaced by uh, Jennifer Eveline, which is wonderful. Um, and this is a, a multi, this is a joint effort across a partnership, federal, state, local government, NGO, the list goes on, as you can see from this organizational chart, effort. This is a lean in effort in every spirit. Um, to kick this off, we put together, um, this is just a copy of it. You can find it online by just Googling it very simply, a resilience action plan. So this is an action oriented effort coming with investment from both the federal, state and other entities to try to achieve some of what was, was talked about largely what Jen outlined in his talk. And I just wanna go through this just, um, it's a little bit of a primer. And like I said, we're, this is what we are doing right now. And I believe it's timely. So that action plan has four broad goals. Um, it has, the first goal is to increase the pace and scale of forest health projects, um, also community resilience, which is the, the second goal. Um, and we've got, a lot of money that we're going to be applying. We haven't figured out exactly how we're going to be doing that um, to, to address these critical problems, to really increase the pace and scale um, in the most efficient manner possible across California, mindful of the diversity of the state, mindful that what we do in the Sierra or the North Coast isn't applicable to Southern California. Um, but th that is something that we are going to do. We are going to treat a million acres by 2025 and ramp up thereafter. We're going to also strengthen the protect protection of, of our communities. Um, and these are just these bullets are just one of many examples that fall into there. Um, that's a that's a big deal. It's super important, especially we're seeing more of our fires starting in our, our forested areas, state lands and federal lands and burning into and over in many cases our communities and that needs to be addressed. We need to look at the problem. Um, we know many of our fires are, are, are not started by lightning. Um, they're started by human infrastructure and also um, by people. It's oftentimes during extreme weather events. And we need to get at the root of that problem. We're going to manage our forests to achieve economic and environmental goals. Um, this is this is an enormous place that we really need to um, tease apart. We need to look at our markets. We need to look at alternative um, forms of, of of economies, like small um, dia diameter um, um, uh, trees from our forests, feedstocks, etc. We're investing in that. And we're going to drive innovation and measure our progress. So this is going to be the design of this, as Jen mentioned, is going to be self-correcting. We are monitoring. We are going to learn as we go, and we're going to adjust in time. And again, these are just a few examples from that. So within that, there are 99 actions. So this is an update um, from the beginning of last month of where things are. Um, this can all be found online. So all of those goals are broken down into key act activities, actions, expectations of accomplishment, the product that we are actually working on and tracking regularly through time as we move through this. Um, a lot of these are going to morph in time. Like I said, this is a this is a, the whole model that we're working with is is by design self-correcting, and we're paying attention to that as we go. Um, so I, I get that what I'm talking about is a little bit higher level than what um, some of the previous talks had gotten at, but this is what's happening in California right now, and I thought it was really timely. So you can, I'm not going to read some of these things because I, I fear we're just a little bit over time, but you can um, read some of the things that are going on in just a snapshot of some of the key actions here. So one of the things that we've actually been struggling with, um, and I think the word struggle is fair because you know, I'm an ecologist, I have three degrees in ecology or some variation thereof. Um, this, is, this is just as much ecology, this is just as much fuels management, this is just fire science, this is just sociology as it is organizational management. Um, and we're really working to ensure that we have, um, I, I think, um, a nice integration vertically of align for alignment, but also importantly, horizontally so that we can actually achieve the targets that we set out to realize 
um, through the through the through the application of those actions, and then um, many of which are kind of summarized here on this slide. We've got many statewide mandates that are going on. Um, there are also federal mandates at the same time. We've got you know, 30 by 30 is one example in California. We're trying, we're, we're going to conserve 30% of, of California's lands and coasts by uh, 2030. There's a, couple, there's a couple other listed. There's many others that aren't listed on here. This is just for illustrative purposes. We've got directives and mandates, shared stewardship memorandum of understanding. I think most people on this, on this um, uh, call or in this session are familiar with that. We've got our action plan. We've got a suite. Many of those actions that I mentioned call for statewide strategies, um, prescribed fire, manage fire, reforestation, the list goes on. This isn't comprehensive, this is just an example. But the whole idea here is to provide the resources at a regional level. So at that regional and sub-regional, even local level, those groups, those collaboratives, those entities can make the decisions based on their own objectives and their own targets. But we want to, what we want to do is in, be able to provide them with the resources so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel time in, time out. But they also know what the, what the outcomes um, are that they're attempting to realize through, the, through the, what will be soon um, some form of, of, of financial assistance. Um, we've, we're investing a lot in decision support tools. We're investing a lot. We already have. I'm not going to show anything about it here. But as Jens mentioned, they're I mean they're kind of they're falling off the shelf. There's so many things that are being created and put together. And, and we've worked very closely as part of the task force to, and, and Pacific Southwest Research. And, um, and some academic partners on, on attempting to curate this and make sense of this. So they are in fact decision enabling through the processes of prioritization, planning, implementation, and monitoring, knowing where you are along either the, the NEPA or in California, the CEQA process. Um, and the whole idea for that is that that again, enables those, those regional groups um, through those frameworks that we're developing profiles and ultimately um, goals and outcome based um, um, efforts of which they then set priorities or objectives to realize. Um, that then will lead to project and, uh, sorry, local plans and project pipelines of which we're working to support that are gonna be you know, tailor-made for the groups on the ground. So there's, there's a lot of this that might seem top-down, but just as much of this is gonna be bottom-up, but we wanna meet them at the space to where they're at so that we can help facilitate and advance the objectives of really getting to that increased pace and scale target by 2025. Um, we're investing a lot in the data and the tracking system. And then in the last, which I'm, I'm not gonna get in too much detail here, just in the interest of time, um, and this is a work in progress, this is probably gonna change by tomorrow afternoon, um, quite honestly. But what we're really trying to do is, is we're going to invest in some form of a million acre strategy. And that, that name is in flux. And I'll talk about it in my final slide in just a moment. But that's going to be essentially the kind of the, the CPU of this whole thing. That's going to be the central organizing unit. Um, and it's going to have functionally three components. It's going to organize the various strategies, initiatives, and mandates, coordinate those, curate those, and ensure that there's alignment and identify and identify where the redundancies potentially are, but just as important, um, and show us where the um, show us where the gaps are. Uh, like I mentioned, this is all about giving regional and local support, and a great deal of what we hope to do with this million acre strategy is to provide regional toolkits, um, all lands plans or, or opportunities for them. Um, those might come in the form of, as I mentioned before, those profiles. Um, and, and those types of products uh, and, and identifying treatment opportunities, not necessarily targets, but windows, ranges that would be ob objective focused um, and help them with project priorities in their planning. And then a big part of this is kind of the information create curation and data support. Um, we've got the, a forest data hub that we're working on in California. We've, we're working on an interagency tracking system We've got a whole suite of different scenarios going on um, in California, like we do across the United States. Um, and important here is also being able to report and understand ac accomplishment and what that means. Um, 
I'm going to be completely transparent. This was something that we worked through to some degree um, yesterday, and th this is not what it looks like now <laughs> with the email traffic that I was seeing earlier this morning. Um, and this is this is likely going to change. But uh, I think that for me at least, this has been a, a humbling experience. I've I've said this before. You know, we don't totally know what we're doing. Um, but we have a lot of smart people around the table that have that have willingly rolled up their sleeves and are leaning in and we're working across boundaries and we're working across our silos to really tackle this effort, this issue head on, which, which I think is just a remarkable thing to be a part of and to watch. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to close there. I want to thank the organizers and the other panelists for, for your, your talks and your insight. And um, if you'd like more information, please visit the Climate Hub's website, reach out to me directly, or you can just simply Google California Forest Management Task Force and all this information will be available. Thanks, Ed. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, great perspective from, from the Climate Hub. Um, we, uh, I should mention, several of our speakers have, have mentioned links, um, and those are posted in the Whova chat. If you, if you're participating in this and want to go, report or check out any of those links, there you can access them, them through the Whova chat uh, feature. Well, we have one more one more um, panelist to give a perspective on partnerships dealing with the, the overwhelming challenge sometimes it seems like it isn't really but it, it, it's certainly everybody's highlighting that it's a very big challenge um our, our last speaker is megan o'rourke also with the department of uh, agriculture and uh she's going to give i think a bit more of a, of a pure research perspective so megan please take it away hi thank you um, let me share my screen here Let's see, is this full screen yet? It looks good. Great. So um, I, I know we're really short on time. I'm going to try to breeze through this, but I am uh, Megan O'Rourke. I'm the National Science Liaison, no, excuse me, for um, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture with USDA. Um, our mission at, at NIFA is to invest in and advance agricultural research, education, and extension to solve societal challenges. So we are mostly working with university stakeholders, um, though we also um, have awardees for our funding mechanisms at, at different federal agencies as well as nonprofit organizations. Um, I, in case people don't necessarily think of, of USC NIFA as a place where we fund higher science. I just wanted to lay out some specific um, programs that we do have in which awards are available for um, the areas of work that I think people are interested in here. So we have the Renewable Resources Extension Act, the McIntyre Stennis grants. We have sustainable agricultural systems within, we have a large program called AFRI um, as a way to look for these programs. We specifically have a priority area called sustainable agroecosystems that also funds um, forestry and rangeland systems. And I will speak here, go a little bit more in depth about this new extension education and USDA climate House partnership program, also within the AFRI foundational area. Um, over the last year, I've played a key role in creating this program. And uh, I think it's really exciting in the sense that to the best of my knowledge, um, my funding organization, NIFA, has never really required partnerships before as a way to um, move forward in innovation. And so I want to share my experience working through some of that process of, of having this required partnership program. Um, so the specific priority is called, again, the Extension Education and USDA Climate Hubs Partnership Priority. Um, it just was funded this first cycle in FY21, is also this in, or FY22. And the scope of the program is $10 million per year with each project being $1.5 million. And the goals are to address climate change through regional partnerships that include USDA climate hubs and the extension system. 
So the extension system, the cooperative extension system in the US, if you're not familiar with it, is part of the land grant university system and mission and its informal education scattered um, in nearly every county throughout the United States. The goals of the program were net zero emission agriculture, working lands adapted to climate change. So that second point is specifically, um, I think, well suited towards fire science. Um, it's also focused on diverse workforce, creating a diverse workforce skilled in climate change science and in addressing climate justice. And while the partnership uh, required a partnership between the USDA Climate Hubs and Extension, we, we really sought to expand that further to um, provide ideas to applicants and in, in other partnerships that we thought could be fruitful. So we specifically called out in the call for proposals um, an invitation for applicants to make contact and propose collaborations with the RISAs, with the CAS, and the Joint Fire Science Program and Fire Science Exchange Network. Um, and so I just hear my thoughts about how this, how this has gone, how it works. If you're creating a new um, partnership program, um, a new collaboration, what do you need to, to take into account? Um, my first, first thing that popped into my mind right away was, was time. Um, sure, you know, if, if you have your team that you always work with and you're going to do another project along the same, same lines of what you've done before, you can hurry up and do that quickly. When you're creating new partnerships and collaborations, you really need to dedicate the, the time for um, getting to know people. Um, my second point there is, is communication. Often there can be different cultures between different organizations. So just learning, learning to speak the same language, learning to understand what drives different groups, how to, um, how to create win-win partnerships in which these are, are fruitful collaborations for all parties involved, which I think brings me to that third point, which is, is the compromise. Um, how do you understand different partners' needs and, and goals and drivers and incentives in order to, to create um, a win-win program? And, and in many cases, that's going to require compromise. You may not be able to get everything that you would perfectly want in your best case scenario, but hopefully you're bringing something greater than that through a compromising effort. And then I think it, it goes down to the, the flexibility. You know, can you can you can you adjust and adapt over time as, as you develop a partnership, as you develop those relationships, as you understand one another better? Um, how can you adjust your goals and adjust your, your milestones? as the relationship and partnership progresses. And then my, my last point there was in creating, this is a little bit specific to the perspective of creating a new um, kind of carrot from the, from the government agency perspective. You know, if we're creating new programs, how specific do we want to be? Do we want to say partnerships are required? Do we want to say specific organizations need to partner together? Um, or not, do we want to focus and already say, these are the goals we want to have accomplished or where do we have that balance of really inviting a grassroots um, ideas from the bottom up for things that, you know, maybe sitting in government, maybe sitting in a national office, we're not necessarily um, anticipating local and regional needs. And so, well, this program is, is only in its first year. We're in our first funding cycle. Um, so it's playing out and we're, we're going through this process. I think some of the benefits that we hope to see are a more efficient use of resources, right? We want to be complementary. We want to be synergistic. We want to um, definitely not be re redundant. And so bringing partners together, I think, can achieve that, that goal. Um, and it's, it's this process of, of new ideas of people and the diversity of ideas and organizations together to create um, before, you know, when we connect this to this idea of, of climate change and, and change in general, likely sticking with the same old, same old way of doing things is not necessarily going to be the most efficient way to address change. Um, 
And so ultimately we're, we're looking for better outcomes than we, we otherwise would have had through, through new and innovative partnership programs. Um, and, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for questions and follow-up. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Megan. Um, great example that I think a lot of us actually were not very familiar with. So that's really a great addition to our panel. Um, I, I've been trying to track the time and um, we had some great presentations, but we are running short for questions. So I'm going to ask everybody to, uh, to um, join us again, right at the top of the hour where we'll have a couple more presentations and another panel and opportunity for more dialogue. And in particular, this is all great uh, material for us to, buy, to be thinking about and digesting. And please join us again for the pan, or excuse me, for the, uh, the fire circle discussion tomorrow where we, we wanna dive much deeper into many of these topics. But in the interest of time, I'm going to kick it back to Jessica, our coordinator, um, to uh, tie it into the break. And please join us in 20 minutes at the top of the hour. Jessica? Thanks so much, Ed. And thank you to all of our speakers and panelists for sharing their expertise with us today. Again, this session will be available in Whova, our conference app, within two weeks after the Congress ends. Up next, like Ed mentioned, we have this session beginning again at the top of the hour, as well as another general session, four special sessions, and two fire circle discussion sessions. To choose the one you'd like to join, just use the agenda tab to the left of your screen, click sessions, and click the main session title to join. To join the session offering Spanish and Portuguese interpretation, just click the session titled Advances and Challenges for Indigenous Fire Stewardship. Thanks again to our speakers and enjoy the rest of your day.